Clash of Empires is a must-visit exhibition about the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, being held in London throughout July 2023. I visited it on Saturday and I can't recommend it highly enough. So this video is a little bit different from my usual ones, as I'm going to show you some of the artefacts from that war that I was actually allowed to handle at the event. And it's even more special because I'm joined by some incredible guests. Let's meet them. Well, as some of you know, I've come down to the Clash of Empires exhibition here in London. It's free. It's all about the Zulu Wars. And here are three of the leading lights from the organisational committee. We've got Alex. It's his brainchild. And loads of the exhibits here are, well, you've collected them over years, Alex. Um, you know, you've got very patient family. That's all I can say. And a very big lock up. It's really, it has everything to do with having the most incredible patient spouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got Ian Knight, who has produced loads of books, written loads of books on on Victorian military history, uh, not least the Zulu Wars. So it's great that you're here with us, Ian. Thank you. Yep, the Zulu Wars has always been my kind of main focus. But yes, I have drifted off into other other Victorian campaigns as well. And and best of all, we have a man from the ground, a tour guide and family, family actually in the battles of the Zulu Wars, Lindy Um And your family were there right at the outset, weren't they? Of course, yeah. Uh, Great great grandfather at the time is the local chief in course called Sihai Ogatongo and his son is Mesogazul, my great great grandfather. So they were part and parcel of the outbreak and uh, in such a way that uh, when the Anglo Zulu war breaks out, uh, they were the first ones <laughs> yeah. uh, to whom the British tested the guns on the 11th and 12th of January 1879 before the big battle of the San Juana on the 22nd. They fought throughout these Anglo Zulu wars and uh, in many battles as well. And uh, Mesogazulu, he dies in 1906, and uh, his father dies in, in 1880, 1884, which is the time of the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. Guys, those guys were very Sorry, involved, 1883. Yeah, you get it right, yeah, 1883. But this is a brilliant exhibition to anyone who's interested in the Zulu Wars, uh, British colonial history, British military history. Get yourselves down here, uh, where, as I say, we've got this brilliant Clash of Empires exhibition free of charge for the whole of July. Well, I'm here, I'm here with Ian Knight, who everyone, well, a lot of you will know as a leading authority on the Zulu Wars. And here I'm holding a belt from the 24th Regiment of Foot. But what I love with this, Ian, is that, of course, the 24th were actually, where well, everyone now knows them as the South Welsh Borderers. And, yes. uh, and of course, in the film Zulu, we're singing uh, Men of Harlech. Uh, so how Welsh were they? Yes. Um, uh, well, I don't want to upset anybody west of the River Severn, but actually, <laughs> needless to say, in 1879, uh, they were actually the 2nd Warwickshire Regiment, and their association with Wales was only just beginning at that point. They had established a regimental depot at Brecon, I think in 1873, so a few years before the Zulu War, and they were just starting to recruit in the Welsh Borders area. It's not until two years after that the name is changed to the South Wales Borderers. And then they've always had this much stronger Welsh connection since. Um, so there's always a bit of a bitter <laughs> argument as to actually how many Welshmen there were in B Company of the 2nd 24th. Um, generally speaking, people settle for around about 17. If you include some from Monmouth, which in those days was um, recognised as a border county rather than a Welsh county, yeah. uh, you can get up to the mid-30s. Um, but so, sort of it wasn't so we're talking somewhere around a third, a third to a quarter of the garrison of Rockstrift were, a were from Wales. Welsh connection, yeah, okay. uh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry everybody in Wales, but, uh, but actually the, the Welsh <laughs> contingent was a little bit smaller than most people imagine. More from Rockstrift in a moment, including artefacts from Chard, Bromhead, and Colour Sergeants Bourne. But first, to the Zulu Victory at Isandwana. Well, this is something really special here. It's picked up a long time ago when you could still take artifacts off the battlefield at Isandwana. But these are collar badges from the 24 foot. Uh, absolutely. I mean, as far as we're aware, these were picked up by some of the burial expeditions in the late 1879, early 1880 yeah. period. Um, it is, I should say, for everybody's benefit, uh, <laughs> is illegal now to particularly dig for things on the battlefields. Uh, but these are collar badges that were worn by members of the 24th foot. Wow. Uh, now there's an interesting little kind of footnote to this. Um, the, uh, the badge itself represents the Sphinx, which the 24th had won in a battle against Napoleon's troops in Egypt um, at the beginning of the 19th century. 
Uh, and in fact, the mountain of Isandlwana looks a little bit like the Sphinx. So when the 24th arrive there, they do point out this coincidence of, gosh, that's on our collar badges. And they, I read somewhere that some of them thought it was like a, a, almost like a good omen. Yes, some of them did. There you are, the ultimate British irony then. Absolutely. Yeah. But in fact, of course, it turns out to be the, the gravestone to the first battalion who are, who are killed there. The, the display here, and we're going to talk about this uh, you know, as we go on, is just absolutely awesome. And anyone who's interested in British military history and certainly the Zulu Wars. And all of you who've watched the film Zulu, uh, and those of you especially who've watched uh, Zulu Dawn and don't think it's as good as Zulu or it's more historically accurate than Zulu, um, you've got to come along to this exhibition running through the whole of July. Absolutely fantastic. Wow, just look at this. This is recovered from the battlefield uh, at Isandwana. Just tell me a little bit more yeah, about, the, it's got about the, the rifle. Uh, this was issued to um, the Natal Mounted Police, who are one of a number of colonial units uh, raised amongst the white settler population of Natal uh, in the case of the police to police it, but there were other units that were there to protect the colony um, in times of danger. Uh, and they were shipped these rifles, which were supplied to them by the colony of Natal. I think this one has a marking on the back from Blake Moores, who were the oh, right. agent oh. for uh, supplying just to see if we Natal. Can just swing it round that Way, uh, so and can elsewhere you can just about see the name uh, Blake Moore on the back. Um, and as you said, it's got uh, NMP where it's been issued to the Natal Mounted Police. Uh, and this is basically the same mechanism that the British military were using. This is the carbine version for uh, carrying on horseback, so it's lighter and shorter. Um, yep. But the Martini Henry rifle was the standard infantry weapon of the time. And this, um, and this has been deactivated. And this but, one's been deactivated. It's in, got the cut there and yeah, it so, doesn't quite work there. So in theory, if we drop that down, it doesn't quite work because it's no. been deactivated, but the cartridge goes in goes there. Goes in the top, yeah. Uh, and and into the barrel. Into the barrel, and then you fire it, and when you do that again afterwards, Bang. it ejects the cartridge out the other side. Uh, and yes, the, this one reputedly was recovered at Saint Luana. I know, I mean, what we've also got recovered from the battlefield is, is actually some cartridges that would have been fired by, well, that would have been used in, in rifles like this. Clash of Empires is being held at the Royal Philatelic Society, which is close to Cannon Street Station in central London. It's free of charge. I'll post a link to their website and how you can get tickets in the description below. Well, well, we're on one of the cases that's actually from loads and loads of exhibits from Rourke Strift. And in my hands, I've actually really honored to have a letter written by Lieutenant Bromhead VC at Rourke Strift just after the battle to his sister, um, which is absolutely amazing, isn't it, Ian? Uh, it is. Um, in fact, Bromhead, funnily enough, wasn't terribly communicative. There's not an awful lot. They couldn't get him to write an official report. Uh, and in fact, there are very few letters. There's just one or two letters that he wrote to, to his sisters. Um, and this one's nice because it's actually dated Rourke's Drift uh, on the 22nd of April, 1879. Um, now, that's one of the things that makes the postal material in the, connect, in the collection and of course, we are at the Royal Philatelic Society, so that's a, a deliberate nod to them and, uh, and their encouragement with us. Um, but it is actually signed and dated. When you're trying to work out a provenance for anything, you know, quite often you can mm. narrow it down. But a letter, he says, here I am on this day, writing, sitting yeah. on a stone or whatever, or a biscuit box and writing home. Mm. And this, this was obviously written a couple of months after uh, Rook's uh, Drift, three, three months after yeah. Rook's Drift. Um, but um, he's still there. Yes. And he actually makes a note in there about we haven't seen much of our friends the Zulus. Uh, yes, he <laughs> so, does. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, he said it's, it's sort of been very quiet since uh, since that night, the other <laughs> night, and, uh, and nothing much is happening. And they were stuck there for yeah about three months afterwards in very unpleasant conditions actually. And um, quite a lot of the, the defenders of Rourke's Drift who managed to survive that night on uh, 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 that night it, 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 fighting yeah. uh, then succumbed to various tropical diseases. They did. It was very insanitary there because, of course, um, Lord Chelmsford's column, which had been away from the post on the day of the battle, uh, comes back uh, and then Chelmsford leaves his men there to secure the border in case the Zulus come and attack. So you've got whatever it is, eight, 800, maybe a thousand men camping there um, for months afterwards dead Zulus turning up in caves or lying mm. out in the veldt, it got very insanitary very quickly. Uh, and then you started to get people going down with typhoid and all sorts of unpleasant. Chard himself was very ill for a while um, and had to be 
taken off to doctors down in Ladysmith until he recovered. Uh, so there are a number of men whose names are on the monument at Rock's Drift. Uh, on one side they've got killed, and it means those killed in the battle. Yeah. And then on the other it says died, and these are guys who died of, uh, of diseases in this unpleasant situation. Imagine, imagine, imagine surviving Rock's Drift only to go down yeah, with the absolutely. disease afterwards. And yeah. that was the, the loss of a Victorian soldier around around the globe, wasn't uh, it, of course? Gen uh, generally speaking, the Victorian soldier was far more likely to die of disease than he was to be killed in battle. And speaking of Lieutenant Child VC, this is actually a Bible that was presented to him, wasn't it, Ian? It was. Um, obviously, the garrison at Rock's Drift became popular heroes uh, in the immediate aftermath of the battle. Uh, and there were a number of, of public responses to that, not military responses. Uh, and a committee of ladies got together uh, to do something for the garrison. Uh, and what they decided would, was that they would present all of the defenders of Rock's Drift with a souvenir Bible. Uh, I'm sure the hard-bitten Victorian soldier was absolutely delighted to be rewarded for all that by being given a Bible. Uh, but this particular one is the one that was issued to Lieutenant John Chard, who of course was the senior officer uh, at Rock's Drift. Uh, and it's interesting, there's a number of other examples that survive, mostly to other ranks, um, and most of those are smaller. So the officers got a bigger edition than the ordinary soldiers. Well, it's interesting we're talking of, of Bibles and, and God-fearing soldiers or not, because actually we also have a handwritten note here from Ammunition Smith. The chaplain at Rock Street, who I have done a video about, and of course he doesn't appear in the film Zulu whatsoever. No, he doesn't. Apparently, the uh, and people do ask me about that. And apparently, the reasoning was well, they made Otto Witt, the missionary, a much bigger character than you know really he was in the battle, um, and they decided that two clerics would have you know overbalanced the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's quite a nice little note there because it's dated 1880 and he talks about having lost all his possessions uh, at Rock's Drift when the Zulus uh, captured the hospital building and, and part of the campsite and everything. Uh, so he's saying, well, I lost all my kit there uh, oh. at Rock's Drift. So and whilst, there's direct relevance to it. And whilst Otto Witt takes a, a much bigger role in the film than, uh, than uh, he probably did in real life, or he definitely did in real life, mm. of course, someone who took a massive role in the film, uh, yes. and everyone asks, why didn't he get a Victoria yeah. Cross? Yeah. Colour Sergeant born. Yes. And we actually have a small note there from Colour Sergeant, handwritten. Yes, indeed. I mean, Colour Sergeant Bourne, Bourne is... Uh, Colonel Sergeant Bourne is, is, of course, is one of the great characters in the film. It's Nigel, uh, Nigel Green, Nigel I think, Green. played him. Yeah, 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 indeed. Uh, the real Bourne, I think, was 23 at the time. Um, much, much younger man than he, he's portrayed in the movie. Uh, and in fact, um, when you look at who got the Victoria Cross and why, they are all specific incidents that they're recorded, uh, that, that are recorded, that they were awarded for. Um, and when you, people say, well, why didn't Bourne get one? Well, the simple answer is that although he was there encouraging the men firing over the barricades, there's no particular incident where he leaps on a barricade and fights off a dozen Zulus or something that, that would be cited to give him the Victoria Cross. Uh, but he lived, um, he continued to serve and he lived to be one of the last defenders. They say the last, but there's one or two we're not quite sure about. Um, one of the last defenders of Rock's Drift to die, and he lives all the way up till 1945. Uh, and funnily enough, photographs of him in later life do look a bit like Nigel Green in the movie. So they obviously <laughs> took that so kind took of a look that. Yeah, and the, put it in the film. The Clash of Empires exhibition is running for the whole of July, and it's free to visit. So if you love British military history, and the Zulu War in particular, then get yourself down to London. I'll post a link to the Clash of Empires website in the description below. Thanks for joining me for this special video and I hope you enjoyed it. I also hope it whetted your appetite to visit the exhibition. But if you can't make it, well, I've got some of my videos coming up for you in a moment. It's Andwana, Rook's Drift, Ammunition Smith, Colour Sergeant Bourne, Battle of Intombi, to mention just a few. Let's face it, you can never get too much of the Zulu War.